very grateful for this opportunity to share some thoughts uh, with you. Very grateful to the interpreters, to Russian and Turkish for their efforts. <laughs> and uh, so many thanks uh, from the beginning to the organizers for having me here. Um, I'm a, um, an expert in, in law and religion, um, a lawyer by training, used to look at religion uh, in all its implications, but uh, this is just to suggest this, uh, uh, this presentation will be very much influenced, of course, from the a very specific perspective of uh, a, a legal scholar. And uh, uh, the three points that I will uh, uh, briefly uh, touch upon are, in fact, dependent from my very perspective as a scholar in law religion. So one first uh, extremely brief point will be about what does the legal uh, uh, perspective on tensions around the contribution of religion to uh, uh, employment, employment mean in the perspective of the religious contribution to a decent, productive employment. And my analysis here will be limited to my uh, continent, Europe. Then I will look at four uh, categories of framework which are very uh, 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 fundamental for the kind of encounter between religion and employment that I will look at. And uh, 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 finally, third point, eight decisive factors. Now, where does my presentation come from? Uh, a number of uh, very relevant studies and uh, researchers. Um, and of course, uh, I wish to mention once again um, the Religare project, uh, which has been uh, a foundational for uh, us as scholars of religion in Europe, but also the very, very important study from the uh, UN Special Rapporteur that we had uh, yesterday addressing us during the, the, the dinner, mm -hmm. and that is also a very important document. Now, for the sake of this very specific presentation, I will mostly rely on the proceedings of a workshop which took place very, very recently, just last week, from Thursday to Saturday, near Madrid at the uh, University of Alcala, and which uh, 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 gathered uh, experts in law religion uh, around precisely this theme of religion in the workplace. So I'm very grateful to my colleagues in this consortium, and I'm very grateful, I will repeat my thanks, they are down at the bottom of the slide, to Mark Hill, a QC who's here with us. Thank you, Mark. So many, many thanks, because uh, especially the second point is uh, literally drawn from his uh, conclusions to this Alcala meeting. Now, um, this is the very uh, fundamental question when we look at the legal dimension of uh, tensions arising from the encounter of religion and the employment. So uh, uh, as we look at these legal tensions, uh, uh, what are we saying in fact about the very topic of our session, which is the contribution of religion to productive, decent employment? Now, I will briefly sketch an answer using uh, one document from a, a British independent uh, body, ACAS, Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service for Employers and Employees in, in Britain. This uh, organization uh, issued in 2005 guidelines for employers and employees uh, for uh, accommodation of religion or belief in the workplace. Let me quote a, a, a brief passage from the introduction to these guidelines. I quote, fairness at work and good job performance go hand in hand. Tackling discrimination helps to attract, motivate and retain staff and enhances an organization's reputation as an employer. Now, this is just one possible explanation of the tie which exists between uh, a, 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 a sensible uh, a management of tensions arising from religion or belief in the workplace, pointing, as you can see, at, on the one hand, the quality of the job performance, and on the other, on uh, 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 attracting motivating, retaining staff, and third, the reputation of the organization. I 
uh, uh, suppose that the list might be longer. But this is just an example of how uh, looking at legal management and policies, private or public, in this area are in fact very relevant to a much wider topic, which is productive and decent uh, uh, um, employment and the role of religion in it. Now, uh, what about these four categories of framework under which we have uh, observed the encounter of religion and deployment taking place in Europe? Uh, uh, which are also the four fundamental categories under which we should try to understand issues and solution to issues. First uh, category, a person of faith employed by a private company. So we're not uh, 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 here uh, uh, looking at uh, the configuration of the, of, of the private company. We're rather focusing on the fact that the person, the employee, might have a, 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 a religious affiliation, might have a strong religious conviction, and of course he or she is not willing to uh, leave this uh, a conviction uh, at home when he or she goes to work. A second uh, 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 hypothesis or category is a person of faith employed by the state. Problems do not uh, arise in the same way in the different countries in Europe. There are countries in Europe who, uh, uh, for uh, different reasons, uh, 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 more, more tolerant towards certain kinds of religious uh, uh, behaviors on the workplace. Others who uh, uh, have uh, 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 pretty high requirements which, which, which are resented as discriminatory very often by employers. So uh, this is the second category. A third category is employment by an organization with a religious ethos. Uh, and fourth, ministers of religion who are in fact uh, 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 employed e into the organization. So for uh, uh, each of the four categories are very relevant because they shape conflicts and they shape in fact also uh, responses to conflicts. But what is very important to understand is that the, each of the four is undergoing challenge and change. So what we mean by each of the four is under uh, a, a, a lot of pressure for change. What we understand in, U in Europe for a private company is, is, is changing. Uh, what we understand for the state requirements vis-a-vis uh, -vis religion is changing. The same applies to uh, organizations with religious ethos. And the same also applies to ministers of religion. Just, just to think of the fact that this category has been, of course, shaped in the law in Europe uh, based on uh, uh, Christian churches and that the adaptation of these categories to uh, 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 religious traditions uh, that understand in, in a completely different way their organizations and special positions with, within their organization is, of course, a challenge in society and in, in, in the law. And let me also stress that these three, four categories also interact with, 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 with one another. Now, uh, uh, um, the, the final point in my presentation is pointing at uh, eight factors which are very important uh, when we deal with conflicts that come out th in, in those four uh, categories. And in fact, this uh, uh, again is about, on the one hand, looking at uh, how conflicts and tensions arise, so it's more a sort of observation on an objective level, but I would also like to underline that for uh, academics, experts, and, 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 and the, the, the civil society, religious organizations, I would argue that it is very important to pay increasing attention to how to handle each of these eight factors. It's, th this is really, I believe, a part of the exercise which is required in view of the end that we said to ourselves, being careful and, and uh, towards each of the eight, which I will uh, uh, very, very briefly mention now. Now, one point, yes, one point which uh, 
uh, I uh, wish to, to underline when we look at uh, uh, um, crisis on the ground, tensions on the ground, uh, and we, when we look at the case law, this, come, this, this is very uh, uh, apparent, is that we must care for circumstances and context. Our fact finding at that level is often very poor, very inaccurate. Second element, how we draw the line between public and private. We mentioned before, the state as the employer, a, public, uh, a private company as the employer, a lot is changing there. And drawing the limits and the consequences of, 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 the, of the line that we draw is, is very influential and, and, and very difficult. Uh, the criteria of a duty of loyalty, and especially this ex expression that has been used by the European Court of Strasbourg, heightened duty of loyalty, this also deserves a lot, a lot of uh, careful reflection. What does it mean that this duty of loyalty bounds in a special way an employee to an employer on both sides? A ministerial exemption as far as uh, religious ministers are concerned. How do we frame, again, this exemption? To what extent? Towards which kind of employer? Contractual arrangements. How is, uh, is it desirable that we uh, invite and encourage uh, a private, uh, a partners, especially in the private sector, to uh, uh, carefully uh, uh, draft and define uh, the arrangements, and then uh, again, to what extent those uh, contractual arrangements uh, should be binding, especially vis-a-vis -vis conversions. We had a case in Germany where an employee who was accepted as a Catholic in a Protestant uh, a kindergarten was no longer accepted and dismissed because he had converted to another Christian church, for instance. Uh, grounds for dismissal. Uh, uh, what about the difference in particular, uh, especially in uh, uh, organizations with a religious uh, ethos or within churches, between uh, a grounds for dismissal that would depend on an objective behavior, uh, uh, concretely and objectively uh, uh, impinging upon the performance on the job on the one hand, and on the other hand, moral requirements, being pregnant, or divorce, or, or other elements, uh, uh, or sexual orientation. And uh, the seven, uh, uh, seventh factor, the position within the organization. We have an interesting string of cases before the European Court of Human Rights, where the court has judged differently uh, different cases based on the degree to which the person concerned uh, was uh, a closer or farer to the core of the organization. So should we treat uh, a gardener uh, uh, differently from a teacher, both employed by uh, religious organizations because their proximity to the core religious message is different, or should we consider those positions in the same way? And lastly, due process. Can we require religious organizations or organizations with religious ethos to uh, apply <coughs> due process and uh, uh, fundamental criteria like the right to be heard as we require those in any kind of uh, employment relation. Is that fair? Is that possible? Which are the consequences? So just uh, eight factors which seem to me uh, uh, as emerging as the challenge for all of us, as I mentioned, uh, both uh, from the point of view of the observation of how conflicts actually uh, uh, um, uh, happen in society, but also as an invitation to shape our expertise and as, as an invitation to look from this perspective at the connection between a uh, appropriate, sensitive, careful work on the uh, phenomenology of conflict and the much bigger and broader question on how religion can contribute to productive, decent employment. Thank you very much.